fresh off of the frame lock series, I'm continuing to do some work on some frame locks and liner locks since I've already set up and tooled up for all that. Got a good bit done on the liner locks. I have to make some Damascus. I'm gonna be making some twist bars for a few folders. But right now I'm out here this morning, our deer season rut don't start for probably another week where it really kicks in good. Just walking the trails, checking on wildlife, looking for tracks, looking at sign, enjoying my morning coffee and a morning walk. It's a brisk 34 right now and a light frost, which I really like because it's a natural weed killer. I don't have to cut grass. But right now I'm getting back in the shop, continue to work on those liner locks and I'll start making some Damascus billets here shortly. So what you saw me doing there when I was milling the scales on this liner lock is I was putting a taper in here down to where the end of the lock bar stops. If you don't do this, your detent ball is sticking out. And when you move your liner over to unlock your blade, that bar needs to move somewhere. The width of the detent ball is sticking out. If not, that blade's going to be very hard to open and close. It'll be in a bind, a lot of friction there, put a lot of pressure on your liner. I see a lot of people making these and not relieving that area. So like here on this old liner lock I've used, made this probably 30 years ago. So when you push your liner over, it needs somewhere to go. So when your blade starts coming down, your detent ball is not putting a tremendous amount of pressure there. And you'll see a little gap there. This one here is a little heavy. Elliot Elamondo is the one who helped me learn how to taper them instead of just cutting the same depth all the way across. Great maker, Elliot Elamondo, you need to look him up. Makes very fine high-end liner locks. So now all I need to do is put this one together and profile the scales and it'll be ready to go. Got to grind a blade, of course. But I've got to prepare some Damascus. I'm going to be making some twist Ws and I'll probably get the layer count up to about 150 or so make it look good. And I'm gonna make a few folders out of it and probably a fixed blade. I'll need enough for bolsters because those liner locks with Damascus blades are gonna have Damascus bolsters as well and probably lock bars. And I've got my steel cut up to make our pattern. I think it's 21 layers. Yep. If you don't know, I'm using 15N20 and 1084. The 15N20, it's got a little more nickel in it. It'll give contrast in your pattern. And I've got them staggered here, but I do have a, a little bit different than just staggering them uh, one to the other. I've got a darker core in here. The blue is the 1084. And I've just got a little brighter edge here. I doubled up on the 15 and 20. So what I'm going to do is tack it all up, put a handle on it, stick it in the forge.
So I got the billet cut and restacked, and now we've got 252 layers of Ws. What I'm gonna do is draw it out to about a one inch square, and then I'm gonna slightly round the edges to reduce stress, and then twist it. I'm gonna twist and twist, and then I will forge it out flat to make our final billet for our folder blaze. Let's do this. So while that billet's cooling down, I'm gonna get back on these folders and have some coffee. So what I've got to do here, I'm, I've got some mono steel blade liner locks I'm working on, as well as the Damascus folders. And I've got to tap the remaining holes for the scales in these. I've got to cut and release the lock bar. Got everything marked for that. I've already drilled these scales and I need to counter bore them down to the depth for the button head 256 screws, and I've got to counter bore for the hidden pivot head that'll be underneath those bolsters. Quite a bit to do. So I'm working on three of those and a couple Damascus liner locks, but we gotta get this done. Then we'll grind that billet and reveal the pattern. I still got a good bit of work to do. I still have to contour it and I have to come in here and relieve the handle material where the liner can move over like I've done this one here, like I showed in the beginning of this video. So I got to cut in here to let the liner move, give it some room, but this one's contoured and I'll do this, contour this one after I do that relief work and do the cleanup and uh, start fitting the blade to it. But right now our billet's cooled off. Let's get it cleaned up, test at it, and see what we got to work with. All right, I got it cleaned up to about 400 grit. It's kind of rough. I didn't do a bunch of cleaning on it. So I just want to test at it, and I'm only going to be able to test at up to here, eight or nine inches. And uh, just to see how the pattern looks, we're gonna stick it in four parts water and one part ferric chloride. And we'll let that set about a minute and we'll be back right now. Now I'm gonna clean it off with some Windex to neutralize it and then we'll take a look at the pattern. Now this billet is about 5 sixteenths and it's just a rough cleaning job with a one minute etch. Now this pattern is gonna change quite a bit as I grind down into it. 
it's going to get tighter and it'll look pretty unique. So now I'll surface grind it and make blades and backspacers. Quick little story here. I made this knife for a hunter about 25 years ago. It's a clip point hunt knife, bolsters, stainless steel. There's a little story with it. He skinned a lot of deer and hogs, very avid outdoorsman, hunter. And um, he had a fire in his shop where he kept all of his hunting gear and everything. And this knife was out there. What's crazy is that that, that shop burnt down pretty much. There was still some left, but handles burnt off of the knife. They had some real nice burl wooden handles. And he brought it to me to ask me if it was, you know, could be salvaged. And sure enough, the blade is still rock hard. Uh, didn't lose its temper. Pretty amazing. This is ATS-34. Kind of hard to get nowadays. The Japanese steel, very good steel. I wish I had plenty of it today. It didn't warp and all that like AEBL does. I like AEBL, but ATS-34 is, is just awesome in my opinion. But anyway, I'm going to restore this knife. He doesn't want me to do anything to the blade. He wants to leave the tarnish from the fire. There's some tarnish on the bolsters. I will have to do some work here because I've got to blend it into the scales that I put on here. But I'm going to refurbish it, build a new sheath for it, and give it back to him. I also did some file work on here. So if you can see that. And, uh, of course, it had dovetail bolsters. Anyway, I thought that was a pretty cool story. So I went ahead and cut the billet, and I etched the other end. Uh, it's, it's probably hard to see with this light, but this lets me know what my pattern is looking like on the other end. And uh, I can kind of see how I'm going to lay out things. Before I cut it, I knew what I was going to do here as far as blades, and I've got to make bolsters and some backspacers. And some of that's going to change because I know I'm going to be using titanium bolsters on at least one of those knives. But these have to be annealed where I can work with them. And then I will surface grind them and lay out blades and do the rest of the work. And a little more why I'm leaving this billet so thick. As you grind down, of course, this pattern is gonna change. It's gonna get a little tighter. So where these twists intersect, It'll create a cross in there, you know, where they're crossing and, and you'll have these diamonds in there. Now, straight twists have very pronounced diamonds. And the further you grind in, the tighter they get. But these are W's, 252 layers of W's. So it's going to be some unique stars, hopefully. And so that's why I'm leaving it like that. As a grind down, this will change. You won't see it like this. That's the plan anyway. But we're going to have to do that on the next video. We're out of time. If you got any questions, leave them down in the comments. But I hope you enjoyed this kind of a day in the life of the bladesmith. And we'll take up where I'm left off right now in the next video. But I want to thank my patrons. And I want to thank you for watching.